Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to The Tolkien Road, episode 319. How do the rings of power work? What powers do they convey? That's the topic we'll be diving into on this episode. Before we get started, I'd like to give a double up air five to our patrons. Get those hands up there, patrons. Three, two, one. Whoopsht. Very nice. Felt that love coming through. Thank you very much. Special thanks to this episode's executive producers, John R., Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien, Jacob Lockham, John H., Scotchy Bobo, and Arrow27. Arrow27. Become a patron by visiting patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Your financial support helps the Tolkien Road to keep on evering on and land you some cool perks along the way. Learn more at patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Also, check out truemisspress.com for Tolkien Road merch, like t-shirts, signed copies of my book, books, and the glorious Two Trees Camper Mug. Use promo code RINGS319 to get 10% off your order. That's truemythspress.com, myths, like mythology. Check out the show notes for the link. YouTube, hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe and let us know what's on your mind in the comments below. All right, so have you ever asked, your, have you ever asked yourself how the rings of power work? In other words... Why did Sauron's ring bring him mastery over the other rings? What sorts of powers did the rings convey? This is a crucial question for the Middle-earth legendarium, but it's one that, in a sense, sits in the background of the Lord of the Rings. We all know the ring verse, and it does, and it does bear a sort of magical gravitas all its own, but we only rarely see the ring at work. So is the ring just a MacGuffin, a mysterious plot device that only exists to serve the story and motivate the actions of the characters? Is there anything there? In short, it's much more than a MacGuffin. In fact, I'd argue that the idea of the MacGuffin, first made popular by Alfred Hitchcock, runs counter to Tolkien's whole theory of storytelling. For Tolkien, it was important that the ring's power be substantiated to some degree. We get some sense of this in The Lord of the Rings. For starters, the ring makes both Bilbo and Frodo invisible. However, the ring also causes Frodo to enter into an overlapping dimension of reality and allows him to be seen by both Sauron and the ring wraiths. So there's like a give and take of powers there. We get other hints that the ring somehow commands the respect and even obedience of others. This is a somewhat more abstract concept. But we get this sense from the reactions of characters such as Galadriel and Gandalf to being offered the ring. And the ring grants long life, even immortality, but something like conditional immortality. Take Gollum, for example. He's able to live an unnaturally long life, but not a normal life by any means. In fact, not really a life that any of us would want to live forever, uh, immortally. So... Uh, and Bilbo, after possessing it for many years, appears younger than expected, but feels like butter scraped over too much bread. I know exactly what he's talking about there when he says that. I feel that sometimes myself. I'm sure many of you do as well. So while Tolkien doesn't give a nice tidy list of the powers that the ring conveys, we know some of the powers it confers. And we know that in the hands of certain actors of high stature, it would be a catastrophically powerful weapon. So the ring is much more than a MacGuffin, this sort of plot device that doesn't really matter. However, as we seek to understand what Tolkien was getting at with the ring, we need to realize one very important thing. The ring for Tolkien is simply that, Sauron's ring. It's not meant to represent or symbolize anything else. This is something Tolkien insists upon uh, in his frequent, rebuff, frequent rebuffs of allegory. So, you know, it's not like an allegory for atomic power or something like that, right? That was something Tolkien addresses in one of his letters. No, the ring is the thing it is in the book, right? That's what it is in the book. Now, whether it has uh, 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 ways in which it overlaps with other aspects of our reality, right? With aspects of our reality. Yeah, th those things are entirely possible. But that would be more of a case of applicability, as Tolkien would put it, not allegory. Um, so it doesn't mean it's unrelated to whatever things it might bear relation to for whatever reason. And I do think Tolkien had certain ideas very strongly in mind when he wrote The Lord of the Rings. In fact, I know he did. For Tolkien, the ring is indeed a magical device, but he had something very clearly in mind when he spoke of it in such a way as a magical thing. For him, magic was not something meaningless in terms of the primary world. 
In fact, by the term magic, he very clearly meant what we in the modern world would call the machine. In the Waldman letter, he said, By magic or machine, I intend all use of external plans or devices of development of uh, instead of development of the inherent inner powers or talents. Let me try that again. By magic or machine, I intend all use of external plans or devices instead of development instead of development of the inherent inner powers or talents, or even the use of these talents with the, un- with the corrupted motive of dominating, bulldozing the real world, or co- coercing other wills. The machine is our more obvious modern form, though more closely related to magic than is usually recognized make uh use my machine here that i'm working on and make uh make my my text a little larger so i'm not messing up so much all right for tolkien magic is not some pre-modern thing that no longer has any significance for us but is exactly the machine or in other words technology that thing that we moderns like to believe makes us so happy right go back to that definition he just used um the machine so uh it's uh using the uh these talents with the corrupted motive of dominating okay um and oh i thought i thought i had this quote in there but he also says very close to this in the same letter he says for making the will more effective right they're they're powerful the machines are things that are powerful at making the will more effective but for him it's magic and machine are the same thing right so like an ancient sorcerer in tolkien's mind is doing the same thing that a uh you know a powerful person with a machine you know a powerful machine is doing nowadays right they they have something that's useful for making their will more effective more efficient more effective <clears throat> for tolkien magic and machine are pitted against art which the elves by nature tend to employ art is the development of the natural potential of something to bring out more of its inherent beauty and possibility as opposed to magic and machine which seek to exploit natural faculties in order to achieve greater domination or power. If you want to know the fruits of these two different perspectives, consider the elvish realms of Rivendell or Lothlorien versus the ring-obsessed realms of Isengard or Mordor. Right? Picture those places in your mind, okay? Uh, Mordor versus Rivendell or Lothlorien, okay? I'd much rather be in Rivendell or Lothlorien. Beautiful places, uh, you know, these people that abide there, They've used their natural talents to beautify these places, to make them these like wonders on earth, these places that you truly want to visit. Mordor, Isengard, lands of slavery, right? Lands of slavery, lands of ash and dust, right? Just horrible places. So how does this all play out in the Legendarium and specifically as it relates to the Rings of Power? In other words, how does Sauron's ring work its magic? So, um, you know, I'd have a... I have so many thoughts on this, you guys, but the thing that I brought up when I was watching the Rings of Power on one of the episodes we were watching the Rings of Power is it struck me for the first time that a really, a really good analogy for the way that the Rings of Power work are something that's very familiar to all of us. In fact, it's something you may be using right at this moment as you watch this video. It's our smartphones, right? Our smartphones. Um, now, how, how does that work? Remember, Let's start from let's start from what Tolkien said about magic and machine, right? Magic, it's kind of the ancient term. We think, oh, well, we don't really believe in magic. We don't even have magic now, right? And machine, but for Tolkien, they're the same thing, right? It's just different terms for the same thing. It's this, uh, you know, these devices, these methods, these schemes we construct in order to make our wills more effective, especially for domination. But I really like the example of the smartphone, and hopefully that's going to uh, really illustrate this you and this for you and bring home exactly how the rings of power work, right? How they work within the legendarium. Um, well, let's look at the ring verse, though. Let's look at the ring verse because this is a very familiar passage for most of us, and it can be easy to gloss over it. But I think there's more there when you read it closely than you realize. Three rings for the elven kings under the sky, seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone, nine for mortal men doomed to die, one for the dark lord on his dark throne, in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all and in the darkness bind them, in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Um, in summary, the ring is really more like a ring scheme, right? That's that's where its real power lies. 
Now, I think there is some truth to it, you know, to the, there is some truth to the device, right? So it's not just this uh, ethereal thing. It's not just this abstract thing. Um, but because the ring is an actual thing within the world of Middle Earth, right? Uh, it is an actual device, but it's kind of like the master device, right? It's the master device over all these other devices, okay? Um, three rings for the elven kings under the sky. Tolkien spoke of the elven rings as the first to be made. In fact, the rings seem to have been the elves' idea originally, whilst with Sauron serving as something like a consultant to make the rings more effective. And it worked. But effective for what? The elves of Middle-earth's greatest desire in the Second Age was actually their natural one, to beautify it, even to preserve it from decay, to make it something like Valinor, the Blessed Realm itself, right? They'd been summoned to Valinor, many of them had come back, and they were kind of summoned to Valinor again, um, but... They wanted to stay in Middle Earth, right? They wanted to stay in Middle Earth. They wanted to kind of have their own dominion over there, but make it like Valinor, all right? So they wanted to be in Valinor, but they wanted to stay in Middle Earth at the same time, wanted to have their cake and eat it too, right? Um, and in, in a way, that's something that the elves were probably capable of achieving, right? To make this beautiful, you know, these beautiful realms uh, within Middle Earth. And we think of Rivendell, we think of Lothlorien. Really, they did, right? And, and you know, in certain ways. So they wanted to make Middle Earth more like the Blessed Realm. Um, so I don't think it's any coincidence then that the Elven Rings correspond to the realms of the three greatest Valar. Manwe, right? That's he corresponds to Vilya, which was the Ring of Air, right? Olmo, uh, he's he's the the Lord of Waters. He corresponds to Ninya, the Ring of uh, the Ring of Waters, and Aule uh, corresponds to Fire, like kind of the 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 Maker, right? Aule is the Maker. Um, he's of the Earth, but you know you think of that as like the fires of the Earth and like forming you know, using fire to form things from the earth. He's Narya, right? So these three rings allowed those who possessed them to ward off the decays of time and postpone the weariness of the world. Now, before we go any further on this ring verse, um, let's just revisit. Let's revisit this concept of the smartphone, right? So your smartphone, what does it do for you? Well, it gives you all these powers, right? It gives you all these powers. And, and again, I'm picking on smartphones specifically because it really hits home for us. And I think they're a certain revolution that really corresponds extremely well to the ring scheme, but it's not like smartphones are the rings, right? They're not that that's not necessarily what I'm saying, but I'm saying like, pay attention to what is going on in middle earth, what's going on in these stories, because they are applicable to what's going on with us and these things. Right. So, um, what, what do I mean by that? Um, you know, we think of the smartphone as this great machine, a marvel of modern technology, but its potency lies not just in the device itself, but its connectedness. We can do things with our smartphones now that would astound people even 50 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago, quite honestly, right? We can communicate directly with anyone anywhere in the world at any time. That's just mind blowing for most of human human history, right? The the 99.9% .9 of human history couldn't even conceive of that. We can list off a whole lot of other powers too, but that's the thing. When you put on the smartphone, I'm putting it on right now, okay, holding it in my hand, keeping it close by, you gain many great powers, but you're suddenly visible in ways that should be truly frightening to you, okay? Um, I'm not being sensationalist about that either. Who's on the other end? Who's looking in on your conversations? We trust that the actors are benevolent, but we better realize that they might not be, okay? Um, this is just the fact of the technology, right? Uh, we don't know who has access to these things at the end of the day. You know, for all, you know, and, and we, you know, we point to other, what's our solution, right? Our solution is often more technology, right? Well, we'll just build better encryption to ensure that those people can't. But give me a break. There's always going to be some answer to that at the technology level, right? Um, at the end of the day, you know, we won't really get into like, how do you beat, how do you beat the ring scheme? Um, but I think the only, the best answer is probably just what the elves end up doing, right? As, as opposed to the, you know, to the, uh, to men, right? The elves take their rings off and hide them, right? They, they, they stop using them and hide them. Um, now I, I don't, I don't know what the answer is for, um, you know, for example, uh, Gandalf and, uh, Galadriel, um, you know, are able to, uh, you know, have some use of the rings later on, the elven rings. 
Um, that's an interesting question of itself, not really one I'm prepared to dive into here. Uh, it could be that they kind of found their own their hacks for these devices because at the end of the day, the Elven rings in particular were rings that were not actually ever touched by Sauron, right? He gave them the technology. He told he kind of instructed the uh, Elvish uh, ring makers how to make these rings, but at the end of the day, uh, he did not um, he did not ever touch them himself. Okay. Um, now, so, so that could be one possible answer to why you know their uh, Gandalf and Galadriel are able to wear them, use them to some degree later on. Um, now. Here's something really interesting Tolkien said about the three Elvish rings. Therefore, the three remained unsullied, for they were forged by Celebrimbor alone, and the hand of Sauron had never touched them. Yet they were also subject to the one. How can they be subject to the one if Sauron had never touched them? Because Sauron created that technology and the scheme that made them so powerful and made sure he could dominate that technology and scheme from the outset. He didn't have to touch them, only invent the technology and teach it to others. Right. So he invented the greater technology. Right. He invented, if you will, uh, the Internet. Right. And and then everybody and, and then was like, hey, this this new invention, just make sure they're plugged into this thing and they'll be great. They'll allow you to do so many powerful things. OK, um, so let's move on to the Dwarven rings, seven for the Dwarf Lords and their halls of stone. Um, so, you know, the dwarves are an interesting case. All right. Um, they, you know, what, what can we learn from the ring verse about them? Well, they dwelt in their halls of stone. Not much there, but what was their real goal? Well, their real goal was to amass great treasures. Um, Tolkien says, The dwarves indeed prove tough and hard to tame. They ill endure the domination of others, and the thoughts of their hearts are hard to fathom, nor they, can they be turned to shadows. They used their rings only for the getting of wealth, but wrath and an overmastering greed of gold were kindled in their hearts, of which evil enough after came to the prophet of Sauron. It is said that the foundation of each of the seven hordes of the dwarf kings of old was a golden ring. All right. So, um, you know, I, I kind of think about this in this way. Um, dwarves, if you've ever seen Parks and Rec, dwarves are kind of like Ron Swanson. They don't want to be seen and there is a simplicity of intent with them. If you've ever met someone like this, you know what I'm talking about. They can seem impenetrable, okay? So um, the dwarves, even though they kept their rings, they they really weren't that, a that easy for uh, Sauron to see them, right? Um, not as easy as it was for, like, men later on, okay? So, um, you know, so that's the, the dwarves were a frustration for Sauron in a different way than the elves were a frustration for him. All right. Um, but nevertheless, they granted the dwarves certain powers. Sauron just didn't get as much back from them as he wanted. Right. And what does Sauron want? He wants, he wants to be able to see what's going on. He wants to be able to surveil them. He wants to be able to, um, to, to look into, to, to look deeper into their spirits, into their souls. Right. So that's what Sauron, uh, you know, that's what Sauron gains when he gives these powers, right? Remember, what's uh, Anatar, right? That was one of his names in the Second Age. He's the giver of gifts, right? Hey, I'm giving you a gift, but this gift comes with strings attached, almost very literally, right? You know, like strings that allow me to look into you, right? That allow me to look into your motives, that allow me to have some control over you. But men is where it really becomes the, the most significant, right? So let's go back and read. What does the ring verse say about men? Nine for mortal men doomed to die. Okay. And that's a really good line there because it speaks to the motivation of men. What do men want more than anything else? Well, we know from the story of Numenor that men want immortality, right? The men of Numenor given a uh, very long life compared to other men, but it's not immortality. And uh, towards the end of Numenor's history, they start, they start seeking immortality, this thing that is not intended for them. Okay. So they want immortality, but it also seems that they want the ability to see more deeply into the spiritual world. Um, but that doesn't always lead to happiness either, right? You know, we, and, and many of us can probably understand this, right? We want to know perhaps uh, what's happened to loved ones who have passed on. Um, we want to know, you know, uh, be able to be able to access deeper secrets that maybe we can't access on a normal, natural level. Um, we want maybe supernatural powers, okay? Um, and so we see, you know, we, ha we have kind of an idea of how the Nazgul, how the ring wraiths became who they are, right? 
uh, they are granted this long life, but what are they, you know, thousands of years later? I mean, they're, they're basically these walking shadows, these walking powerful. They're still powerful in certain ways. They're still alive after all this time, way past when a man should be alive, but they're wraiths, right? You know, they, they've, they've been stretched so thin, right? Over time, their, their, their bodily existence has been stretched so, so thin, but they're still powerful. They're powerful how? To do Sauron's will, Right. That's what they chiefly exist for in this time. He's able He's able to see through them, to see the things they see. Um, he's able to exercise, even when he doesn't have a body, he's able to ex- carry out his own will through them, right? So uh, we see how the rings operate uh, with them. The trade-off initially was, hey, I and, and I don't know actually if it ever says this anywhere in anything that Tolkien wrote, but we see that that it doesn't say it directly, but we see that, right, and how he names it here, nine for mortal men doomed to die. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. This will save you from dying. I didn't say it would make you happy in, be, in being saved from dying. I just said it would save you from dying, right? There he gets his power over them, okay? All right, so, and in the end, how does that one ring kind of work over them all? Well, it binds them all, right? It it calls them all to Mordor, right? To the land, to the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Okay. And why there? Because that's where Mount Doom is, right? It's forged in the fires of Mount Doom. Okay. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them. All right. So it's ruling them wherever they are. It's finding them wherever they are. And, and it brings them, right? It brings them back. Okay. It calls them back and then it binds them into slavery. All right. That's what we see going on with the power of the one ring over the rest of the rings. Again, there's the interesting question of the elves and why and Gandalf and why they're sort of impervious to the to the operations of the one ring much later on in history. And again, I think that's probably explainable in some different ways. I'm sure Tolkien had his own ideas for that. And guys, as I go through all of this, there's so much more that could be said about any one of these topics. This is really one of those as I got it just did the research on it, getting more and more into it. I was like, wow, there's way too much to cover here in one episode. Um, so, you know, this is one where I'm really, really looking forward to y'all's comments on uh, because, uh, you know, there's just so much more that needs to be said. So many interesting, like sort of so much, so much in- uh, thinking that needs to happen as regards to uh, to the rings, right, to the rings of power. But here's something I find really, really interesting. Who haven't we considered yet? We haven't considered hobbits. OK, now. We all know the role that hobbits play in this story, right? In the in the greater story, um, and and hobbit and uh, in the Waldman letter, right, where a lot of this stuff comes from. Tolkien even speaks of hobbits. Um, let me see if I can find this because I've actually I think I've got the um, the Waldman letter pulled up here on my on my computer. Let me see if I can find the specific quote I'm looking for. That would be pretty sweet. Oh no, I'm not looking at the right thing. Um, let's see here. Oh. Well, okay, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it, you guys. Don't go anywhere. Here we go. All right. Uh, if you've never, like, just, again, if you've never read the Waldman letter, you got to do it. Um, okay. I don't know if I've got this one highlighted well enough. Uh, yeah, I don't see it. Okay, basically what I was looking for, you guys, was... Um, This quote where uh, Tolkien talks about um, the hobbits kind of representing this this important theme in his work and and an important theme in history, this idea that like it's the unknown people of the world that are actually the truly powerful ones, right? That actually that actually can uh, have the power uh, that matters most in the end. Okay, it's not the lords and the governors, right? But it's the power. But it's the seemingly unknown and the weak, right? Uh, That that in the end are the most important and the most powerful, which should make you feel good if, like most of us, you're kind of insignificant and not that powerful, right? Um, So here's what he says. I I was reading through um, the prologue to Lord of the Rings recently, and I found this, and I just found it really interesting because of certain words. He says, They do not and did not understand or like machines. Machines. They possessed from the first the art of disappearing swiftly and silently, when large folk whom they don't, do not wish to meet come blundering by. And this art they have developed until, to men, it may seem magical. But hobbits have never, in fact, studied magic of any kind. 
we have it all right there, right? He's speaking about hobbits. And he's not even speaking in the same context as what he was talk- telling to uh, Milton Waldman in, the, in that 1951 letter where we talk about magic and the machine. But he talks about both of those things right here. Okay. They, hobbits do not and did not understand or like machines. They're very simple, right? So they don't, they, you know, they don't like these, this idea of like these tools that make the will more effective. Now they're probably not thinking of, of it on that level. And they probably, um, you know, they don't, uh, necessarily, that's not why they would say they dislike machines. Okay. But they have an inherent distrustfulness of them. Okay. So they're not powerful. They're not looking to become more powerful. That's, that says something about hobbits in general. And they possess the art of disappearing swiftly and silently, which is interesting because whenever Bilbo and Frodo put on the ring, what happens is they immediately disappear. Okay. Now, Tolkien says this is a property of the rings of power in general, that they they confer uh, invisibility, right? Um, but, um, you know, we see, we, we see this happening specifically with the hobbits, and we can see how that's a very alluring thing for them. So if you were going to get power over them with any of the rings... Uh, giving them any of the rings, it would be to, you know, by this virtue of invisibility because they don't like being seen. Um, but they've never, in fact, studied magic of any kind. So anyway, I thought that was interesting uh, to speak about the hobbits here because they aren't listed in the ring verse. They're overlooked. But that's the whole point of the hobbits in the end, right, uh, is that they're overlooked by Sauron. They're not thought of. Um, and and probably to some degree because they don't like machines, Okay. And then there's the whole question of Tom Bombadil. Why is he impervious to the power of the ring? I think it's probably something very uh, uh, similar. It could be become because he's art uh, com- completely actualized, right? That he's art fully developed and completely actualized, that, he's, that he sort of represents that in a way. Um, and I don't think that's a stretch, right? Um, he, he basically is this walking artwork that kind of just is odd in the rest of the, in, in the, rest of the story. Okay. Um, so, you know, there's so much more uh, that I want to say on this topic, and, um, you know, I, I really, there's so much more that Tolkien said on it, but this, this question of how the rings of power work has just been one that has been haunting me for a little while, and I wanted to do some initial research on it and share that with you guys. So, I hope you found this valuable. I hope this, you know, the whole smartphone analogy really helps you understand that better. I think there's a lot. I, I, I think that really makes a lot of sense of what we see going on with the rings of power. Okay. Um, you know, again, it's not that they are smartphones themselves. It's that uh, it, it, it's that they uh, confer power while, re- while requiring you to sacrifice something of your independence, right? Something of uh, your ability to not be seen, right? Um, it, it, you know, the 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 anal- I could go on, but the analogies, uh, you know, the analogies are there. So, all right, well, let's um, let's look at a little bit of correspondence here. So, we have a note from Jake on August second. Jake on August second. Jake said, hey, brother, I wish I could post this somewhere more public, but this podcast is an incredible class act. I started at episode one, and now I'm on 20 and counting. It's great banter and easy listening. It's inspiring and gives hope during the other doldrum work days, the often doldrum work days. I'm a father of three small ones, and I commend you and your wife for your excellent work. I will continue to share. Keep going. This is awesome. Jake, thank you so much. I hope uh, you've continued on the Tolkien Road. This one was sent a little bit... Uh, a couple months ago, uh, been behind on catching up with my mail. So really appreciate you, um, you know, taking the time to comment on episode 300 and hope you're continue to listen. We'd love to hear from you again and continue the conversation. Hey, everybody else, drop us a line. You can correspond with us in a number of ways. Check out the show notes to learn more and we'll do our best to respond to you somehow at some point. All right. Thank you to our amazing patrons, especially the following John R. Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien. Jacob Lockham, John H., Scotchy Bobo, Eru27, Ms. Anonymous, Andrew T., Red Hawk, Shannon S., Brian O., Emilio P., Zeke F., James A., James L., Chris L., Chuck F., Aja V., Ish of the Hammer, Teresa C., David of Pints with Jack, Jonathan D., Eric B., Johanna T., Mike M., Robert H., Paul D., Julia, Werty, Matthew W., Joe Bagelman, Chris K., 
Jacob S., Richard K., Matt R., Garrett P., John W., Eugene D., Chris B., and Daniel S., as well as those celebrating their patron anniversary in December of 2022, Zeke F., Shannon S., Emilio P., Brian O., Andrew T., and Amy H. All right, everybody. Thank you all so much for watching and or listening. We will talk at you next time. Bye-bye.